everyone. Welcome. Healing is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. So welcome. We're going to be talking about dieting a little bit here. But the title of this study is The Glycemic Index and the Microbiome. Recent research, and I'm going to show a study that was just released uh, last week, I believe, uh, it shows how exercise and a plant-based diet uh, change glycemic impact. What is glycemic impact? What is a glycemic index? And that's a term a lot of people are, are, are familiar with. Uh, the glycemic index is a system that ranks food on a scale of 1 to 100 based on their effect on blood sugar levels. Basically, what you eat and how high it increases the level of sugar in your blood. All right, so where did glycemic index come from? So let's back up a little ways. And, you know, it used to be said, hey, the amount of food that you eat is what causes people to get fat or to gain muscle or what have you. Um, well, now we know it's not just the food. So we boiled it down to the macros. Oh, let's separate the food into its compartments, which is fats, carbs, protein, and now we know fiber, the four macronutrients, more, more, brief, more commonly called macros, right? So people started adjusting or playing with their macros to try to get better body composition, lower body fat, maybe more muscle. Okay, so macros, big deal. Not all macros work for all people. So they drilled down a little bit and said, well, then it's the calories. Let's just focus on the calories. It's all about calories in, calories out. Well, now we know that's not true either. It's uh, it, the effect on it uh, is very different. Let's look at macros, how macros are different. Not all macros function the same way. You have whole food macros from whole food versus macros from isolated or processed foods. They behave very differently in the system. You have fats, you have saturated fats, and then you have unsaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fats or PUFAs, which are your omega-3, 6, and 9. So, uh, you know, you have very different things. So just to look at a label and say, oh, that's amount of fats, I can have X amount of fats. Well, if you're eating saturated animal fat, that's gonna behave very differently in your gut, it's gonna behave very differently in your metabolism, it's gonna behave very, very differently in how it affects uh, your overall health when you compare it to polyunsaturated fats. So all fats are not created equal, all proteins are not created equal. A great study showed that consuming a high amount of animal protein actually yielded 500% increase in diabetes, yet the exact same amount of protein if consumed in plants had almost no effect on diabetes. As a matter of fact, many studies have shown it has a positive effect or reduced the risk of diabetes, whereas that same protein, if from animals, 500% increase in diabetes risk. Now, there's a lot more complications, and I'm not going to go into that because of that, because that uh, animal protein is coupled with animal fats, which is a really high risk indicator for diabetes. But let's keep going. Let's look at a fiber. Fiber is the other macronutrient, soluble versus insoluble. All fiber is not created. Some are prebiotic, some are not. Uh, animal uh, fats and proteins have, uh, animal proteins have different amino acid profiles. So the exact same amount of 20 grams of protein of animals, 20 grams of protein of plant sources, very different amino acid profiles. And as we look at one of those amino acids, methionine, we see that the research shows that higher methionine in animal products can actually feed cancer cell growth where it's the exact same amount of protein, it's just because it's a different amino acid profile, it's causing negative impacts versus positive impacts for the plant proteins. So even the proteins themselves can be very different, not the quantity of protein, whether that protein comes from animals or plants and what the amino acid profile is for that protein. Okay, so, Calories are not the same. A cal they used to say a calorie is a calorie is a calorie. It's, we know that's not true at all now anymore. Um, 
So you have fibers effect on slowing, uh, especially carbohydrates, simple and complex carbohydrates into the bloodstream. You have the effect of phytonutrients and polyphenols. It's a really good polyphenol, one of my favorites. It's actually a group of polyphenols, fluoridzin and fluoritin, that are found in apple skin. So if you look at an apple, and you look at its macros, you'll see it's just loaded with sugar, right? Fructose, sugar, glucose, all, all the different sugars that it contains, loaded with it. So you'd say, whoa, I don't want to eat that apple. Too many carbs, too many grams of sugars. Yet an apple has a very low glycemic impact. And why is that? Well, the apple, the tree, actually puts into the skin a very nice gift of nature. It's giving you that source of energy is sugar, but it helps your body regulate it with fluoridin and fluoridin, two polyphenols that are found in that apple skin. It's so successful at doing that, it actually is shown to stabilize blood sugar levels. And they're out actually now looking at utilizing fluoridin and fluoridin as diabetic drugs. They're so effective. That's right. The old adage, an apple a day may keep the doctor away. It'll definitely positively help for uh, it, the risk of diabetes because it, that polyphenol, that group of polyphenols in fruit actually can have a very beneficial effect on how the body regulates blood sugar levels. Really important for diabetics. So as we can see, those calories that are in the apple, those sugars, those carbs that are in the apple are behaving very, very differently than a bowl of ice cream. <coughs> because a bowl of ice cream doesn't have those polyphenols in it, like the whole plant fruit. So you can't it's not good to just take a look at macros. Oh, it has X amount of carbs. Well, no. What type of carbs? Are they complex carbs? Or are they simple carbs? Are they carbs with sugar, uh, with fiber attached to them in their whole food state? Do Are they uh, uh, berries or apples or pears or things that are really high in polyphenols, which can offset and regulate those sugars? Very different. It's not just about the carbs. It's not just about the macros. Those macros don't mean anything in, unless you are actually taking into account what those macros are actually in, what form they are in, what plant food they are in. Are they in an animal food or a plant food? Those, All those things matter. It's not just about macros. When people ask me, what are my macros? I say, I don't know. I don't care. I don't, I don't follow macros at all. I, yes. Do I try to get enough sufficient enough protein to, to, to keep my animalism, my muscle growth going at, at 60 years of age? Of course I do. But I don't, I don't look at it specifically. I look more at where am I getting that protein more in its whole food plant-based state rather than um, from animal products. For sure. I don't consume any animal products. Uh, and so it's more about where those macros come from. What state are those macros in? If you do a, a small amount of, if you do high fat, high carb, this interesting uh, new study just out recently that showed those on a high, high protein, over 35% of your uh, total caloric intake, something I would not recommend for anyone um, to try to get into ketosis with high fat, those two and a very low carb diet actually suppressed testosterone by 37%. So those out there doing the keto diet and, and doing CrossFit, thinking that they're doing their body good, you're actually bludgeoning over by a third your testosterone that'll help you produce strength and muscle. And that's both in men and women. And that's because you're over consuming uh, uh, animal products most likely, or over consuming protein and fats and under consuming carbohydrates. Just by simply adding those carbohydrates, the testosterone levels came back. Or simply by lowering the protein into normal, even what would be considered high for most vegans, um, you would be getting into 30% calories. That still brought normalized the testosterone levels. So it's just the super high, the 35% higher amounts of protein. These people consuming, you know, 100 or 50 grams of whey protein at a time or three to five eggs or whatever at a time 
they're they're really suppressing their own body's testosterone and their body <laughs> body's ability suppressing their body's ability to improve strength and muscle gains and that's borne out in this studies you can look them up yourself and see it for yourself you don't have to take my word for it so why did we come up with the glycemic index because we were looking at how much food we intake then actually affects the levels of blood sugar well now we know that glycemic index is not as accurate as, as it used to be so we used to assign a glycemic index to a food okay this whole food like berries there's a low glycemic index, which means it only increases blood sugar levels by a small amount. But wait, it did something different in those eating an omnivore diet versus those eating a plant-based diet. Wait a minute, the same food, whole food in its state, just eaten by a different person, yielded different glycemic effects? Yes. And the reason for that is this new study that just came out that looked at microbiome. Okay, so let's get to the study. Uh, the study is called, I'll go ahead and put it up in the, in the screen. And they did a, a very interesting way to get to this study. What's exciting about this study is they used a method that's never been used before. This study used, well, let's go ahead and uh, put it up on the screen so everybody can see it. And if you want to type it in and read it at home, you can. Gut microbiome activity contributes to prediction of individual variation in glycemic response in adults. So what they were looking at is they were saying, hey, wait a minute, they're eating the exact same thing, but this group of individuals was getting a higher glycemic response than this group group of individuals. We thought back then we established the glycemic index, the amount that that certain food would affect people. But the microbiome is different in the two people. Then the effect of the glycemia is different in people. So what shifts the microbiome? Well, let's put up the next study and you'll see what does that. Hang on a second. Let me grab it. And right here, here we go. Okay, so the next study is a major indicator of up in the comments section. Okay, the effects of vegetarian and vegan diets on gut microbiota. So this study actually looked at, okay, what happens to the microbiome itself and how does it change when people are on a pure plant-based diet, a vegan uh, diet, eating only fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, seeds, things from plants. So a plant-based diet appears to be beneficial for human health by promoting development of more diverse and stable microbial systems. Okay, so this is important that step one is that the microbiome changes the more plants we eat. And if we're on a plant exclusive diet, that microbiome can shift pretty dramatically. Now, this is a good thing because you're increasing diversity, which means how many different types of bacteria, because those bacteria are actually feeding on the different types of plants. Remember, most people, when they're eating an animal-based diet, you're eating chicken, fish, beef, and pork, mostly those four things. Then you add eggs and dairy in there. So now you're up to like, what, six things, six different food groups? With this, you got fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts, seeds, grains, beans, uh, so many different varieties within all of that that all that different variety each one of those plants has different polyphenols different phytoactives different phytonutrients these are all different things that feed different microbials in our gut and then that adds to the diversity the stronger the diversity the more effective your body gets at processing the food that you consume 
So when you look at those on an omnivore or dominantly animal-based diet, their diversity shrinks because you're only processing meat. So you have what's called proteolytic uh, bacteria. These are also called pathogenic bacteria uh, because they produce uh, 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 metabolites like putrazine and, and uh, cadaverine. These two are made by the bacteria once they're eating up the animal proteins and fats, they're eating them up and pooping out bad pathogenic enzymes uh, and metabolites like putrazine and, and um, cadaverine, which are actually carcinogenic, cancer forming. All right, so you reduce the amount of bacteria in the gut and our diversity. That means your body becomes way less efficient at processing the carbohydrates, at processing the nutrient intake, at processing all the nutrition that's in your food and stabilizing blood sugars. This is one of the key ways that changing to a plant-based diet means that you are going to process the carbohydrates, the fats, and the proteins differently, and they're going to impact your body differently because you've changed the microbiome. Now, it's, it's really interesting in the microbiome, when you're eating a heavily animal-based diet, you have pathogenic bacteria that feed on them. And, and the reason why they do that is they're trying to break down these proteins. When an animal dies on the side of the road, you smell that horrible smell. Those are putrazines being pooped out by the bacteria that are eating that dead animal. That's the exact same process that goes inside in the body. Those same pathogenic bacteria are breaking down the dead animal that's inside of you. And they're producing that putrazine. That's why the poop and the farts actually smell worse in, in, in omnivore animal-based diets. Um, literally, they're producing more putrazines, more of these putrid smelling metabolites, but they're cancer causing, they negatively affect. What they do is they cause inflammation because of those putrazines and cadaverines are actually tr uh, trying to break down uh, heavy duty proteins, proteins just like our own body, they cause uh, stimulation. So our body tries to protect our gut lining by secreting mucus, right? And then you've got a big form of mucus there, which disallows as much penetration or nutrient absorption. When you're eating plants, that fiber sloughs away all that mucus and the, fi and the uh, enzymes, the metabolites that are produced from fiber, which are only from plants, then actually produce butyrates. They poop out butyrates, not carcinogenic putrazines and cadaverines. They produce butyrates. These things actually feed the gut cells, make them stronger, make them more able to absorb nutrients and get more nutrients into the bloodstream, but also to help regulate the body's ability to process those process those sugars. So not only do you have the effects of the fiber slowing uh, the carbohydrates and glucose into the system, you have the polyphenols working both in the gut and in the bloodstream and in the body itself, working in the liver and kidneys and the tissues of the organs, working there to help stabilize and regulate that. So those same carbs eaten by an omnivore can have a very different impact on the human body than those exact same foods eaten by somebody on a plant pure diet. This is what I wanna to try to communicate people. It's not just about macros. It's not just about calories. It's about the plants or animal source of where they're from. It's about how those animal or plant sources affect your gut. When you change the gut, you change the way you process food. This is really important to understand. And that, you know, I've, I've talked to so many people and they say, I wonder why, you know, I'm eating the same amount of macros as that guy. I'm eating the same amount of calories as that guy. I'm the same body weight, same body type, same height and everything else. And I'm working out even harder than him and I'm still gaining fat. What's the deal? The deal is the type of food that we're putting in it and how our microbiome processes it before it even gets into the interior of the body. Very different forms in saturated fat in animals to polyunsaturated fats in plants, um, high uh, polyphenols, high fiber, high antioxidants, high phytonutrients, 
like fluoridsin and, and, and fluoritin that are actually helping regulate the blood sugar system inside of the body that is not present. There is zero amounts in any animal product, not in eggs, not in dairy, not in meat and poultry, not even in fish. It's not a health food. These do not contain the phytonutrients, the polyphenols and the fiber that are in plants. The only place you can get them is from plants. So the more you're eating those, all those nutrients and feeding the microbiome, changing your entire microbiome, changing the ratios of pathogenic bacteria. When you do a, a meat-based diet, those increase the level of pathogenic or gram-negative bacteria. And then because they're fighting for food source, they'll crowd out the good bacteria. So they'll lower the levels of good bacteria every time you eat an animal-based diet or an animal-based food or meal. So within actually 15 to 20 minutes of properly digesting your food, you can already start to see some effects in the microbiome, shifts in uh, the amount of gram positive to gram negative bacteria, shifts in the amount of metabolites that are produced, whether that be uh, negative metabolites like putrazine and, and cadaverines and spermines in uh, bacteria, proteolytic bacteria that are trying to break down the animal proteins is averse to the plant proteins, which are producing fiber feeding of the fibers feeding those good bacteria. And they're producing all these different short chain fatty acids like butyrates and propionates that are actually health promoting for the body and increasing the and improving the body's ability to take those nutrients in and regulate those nutrients. So it's not just about the calories. It's not just about the macros. It's about whether they're from plant or animals and if they're in their whole food state or not. I really want to stress this because it's, it's, there's so much misinformation about, you know, oh, it's all about your macros. It's not. <laughs> it's not. It's, and calories in, calories out. No, that's not how it works. The second major item besides a plant-based diet, which positively affects the microbiome, is exercise. And I'm going to put up a whole host of studies right now so you can read this because there's just so much research on this. Um, I'm just going to put it right into the comment section um, so you guys can read it at your leisure. But check this out. There's such a huge impact. Um, I'll put those comments over there of of diet uh, and exercise. So when you're on a plant-based diet, you're changing the microbiome. When you're exercising, you're shifting the microbiome. The microbiome shifts then to uh, consume some of that lactic acid that your body is producing from the workout and in return, give your body metabolites that it needs to help heal and repair your workout. You know, a lot of athletes have decided to switch over to plant-based diet because the recovery is so much faster. Well, that's because the interaction of our food and exercise with a, a plant-based diet. When you eat those plant-based diets, high in polyphenols, high in oligosaccharides and polysaccharides, which both feed that, high in fiber, all three of those feed your microbiome and allow your growth and population and diversity of your microbiome so that you're getting a healthier microbiome mix. Now you add exercise to that and the exercise where the lactic acid is pushed back into the digestive tract and then converted through metabolites and pushed back into the system so the body can heal and repair itself even better. You combine a plant-based diet with exercise and you have the best of both worlds. And that's why I'm really focused on producing products like uh, clean green protein really high in fiber, high in polyphenols, high in antioxidants, high in prebiotic fiber, making sure you're getting a great gut while giving your body the protein and the carbohydrates and the essential fats. This is even 35% of your um, polyunsaturated fats, your omega-3 fats are in this, in its naturally occurring whole food state, just like the body intended it. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to trying to address this approach to get people to consuming a plant-based diet and exercising, and you are going to have the best and most profound health benefits. You're going to help prevent the advancement or creation of disease states, and you're going to live in optimal health, protecting your brain as well 
both exercise and a plant-based diet have shown in lots of different studies to be neuroprotective and preventative. There even an amazing study that showed that the actual metabolism of meat and animal products in the gut produces these tangles. And it's these tangles that actually get into the bloodstream and lodge in the brain and cause those placking in the brain, which causes the dendrites to shut down and die. And that's senile dementia. That's uh, age-related uh, cognitive decline. That is Alzheimer's disease right there. That's when you're, you're food is actually affecting your brain. It's those tangled proteins that are being destroyed by bad bacteria trying to break down animal proteins, doing a terrible job of it, causing tangled proteins that create tau and beta, beta amyloid plaques in the brain, causing some of that neurodegeneration. Plants, on the other hand, don't do that. They don't create these amyloid and tau plaques. They don't create the microbiome environment that creates that situation. Not only that, they have neuroprotective things like the chlorophyll and the lutein that's in here, vitamin A and beta carotene and lutein, both are neuroprotective. They actually surround the nerve tissues and protect them against damage and causing things. This is what I want for you. I hope you enjoyed this. This It's amazing with this study. This new study is so exciting, and I'll get to this in just a second, is, is that, um, so what they were doing is, look, this is a big study. It was 550 adults, um, uh, and they tracked their food intake, their sleep, their activity, their glycemic response for two weeks. Blood glu glucose was measured every 15 minutes, and then they used a technique called metatranscriptomic. And, and this is allows to see which of the bacteria are not only present, but which of the bacteria's genes were turned on and off through epigenetics. This is really exciting because this is really getting down to the nitty gritty of not only how many bacteria are, are the good guys that are in our system and how they're affected, but how our food is actually affecting the genes of a microbiome, which genes are being turned on, which genes are being activated. This is really exciting because we're getting right down to it and showing that two major things and a plant based, especially a plant exclusive diet and exercise can radically and markedly change what our microbiome not only looks like, but performs like our microbiome is living in a host, right? There's 40 trillion beings living in your gut and on your skin and elsewhere that are depending on you to put good food in this. They are on, you are their planet, so to speak. They are the inhabitants, 40 trillion, that's more than the population of the, of the entire world, living on you. You are the planet and you are feeding them either something good or something not so good. And you are exercising, which also feeds them because that exercise has a direct relationship with the microbiome, changes the microbiome. Check out the studies. It's amazing stuff. And once we understand it, to me, this understanding of the microbiome clearly, absolutely, without exception, tells us we should be exercising on a daily basis and consuming a plant pure diet. Plants are they really the only thing that belong in our gut. Yes, we can put animal products in our gut and survive based on calories and macronutrients. But remember, out of the four macronutrients, animal products only supply three. They do not supply any fiber whatsoever, the fourth macronutrient. So you're not even getting that complete. You're not getting a complete nutritional profile either from animals. There's no vitamin C in, in most animal products. So you're not getting what you need by eating animal products. And it is a caloric survival mechanism. So there's really only two groups on this planet herbivores, those animals that must eat plants to survive nutritionally, and carnivores, those that must eat animals to survive nutritionally. Omnivore is just a made up term by human beings. And it's just describing what you can eat. Well, you can take a typical herbivore and feed it an animal product and it'll probably eat it if it's hungry. 
It doesn't mean it should eat them. It doesn't mean it's good for them. If you look at all herbivores, you put cholesterol in them and you will cause placking of the arteries. You put cholesterol in a carnivore, it does not cause placking of the arteries. You look at the amino acid requirements. Herbivores require nine amino acids. And guess what humans do? Yep, those same nine. Carnivores, on the other hand, have 10. They require taurine, 10 to 11. They require taurine. Well, taurine isn't made by plants, yet humans can survive completely on plants. Carnivores cannot survive completely on plants. So there's really only two forms of diet. Those that, that can survive and thrive healthfully on a carnivore diet and those that can survive and thrive in good health on a plant-based diet. That's it. Omnivore is just the center group that human beings made up just to say, oh, you can eat that. Well, yeah, you can put motor oil down your gullet too. It doesn't mean it should be there. You can put chemicals down it. For God's sake, we're eating chemicals all day long in most of our food supply, artificial colors and flavors. Yeah, it can go in our mouth. Is that something we should be eating? No. Is that something that is required for our survival? No. Well, then you could just call us chemical avores. <laughs> what, because we can eat chemicals and still stay alive because our body tries to defend against them? That's just silly. There are two plant food groups that are basically required, either eating animals or eating plants. Human beings are, are required to eat plant-based nutrition. There's clearly by our microbiome. Our microbiome is telling us when you put animal foods only in, it creates carcinogenic compounds. When you put plant foods in, it creates uh, metabolic byproducts that are helpful and promote health, that stimulate our immune system, that protect our gut, that increase absorption of our nutrients. And those, those animal products do just the opposite. They cause colon cancer. They cause cancers inside the body. They cause the body to produce mucosa and decrease the amount of absorption and of nutrient uptake. Huge difference between these two, not just the macros, not just the calories. Look at what the actual things are doing in our microbiome and in our body, and you'll have all the answers you need of what you should be putting in your mouth. I hope you get this, and I hope the science is overwhelmingly clear to you, just like it is to me. Consuming a plant-based diet and exercising, that's why I formed Clean Machine, a plant-based fitness nutrition. Try to get people more into exercise, eating really good whole food plant-based nutrition and making up for it and, and giving yourself what it needs when there are gaps in the nutrition for that. That's what I want for you. I wish you the most health and happiness as you proceed in your life. And I'm trying to give you products that help you get the most out of life. I hope you enjoyed this one. Share it. Give it a thumbs up. Give it a like. Leave any questions or comments. Happy to answer. Thanks again. We'll see you next week.